Hello again, I'm Bill DeYoung, and this is, you guessed it, the Catalyst Sessions. It's Thursday, and once again, I'm so happy to introduce you to my friend and your friend, Roy Peter Clark. Hey, buddy. Hey, man, got my raised gear on. I don't want to, I want to just root the boys on with a little luck. Uh, by this time, uh, uh, midnight tonight, uh, the team will have uh, earned a place in the World Series. First time since 2008. Go Rays. You may have noticed that the Catalyst Sessions is very, very St. Pete-centric. That's the way we intended it. That's what we want to do. And Roy is one of our favorite guests. Roy teaches writing at the Pointer Institute. He has for at least, uh, oh, 75, 100 years? Yeah, at least. Huh. Not, since, not since Genesis, but since Exodus. <laughs> is that Old or New Testament? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, see, I'm, I'm not, I don't know that stuff. So listen, um, you had an essay in the Times this week, which, which made me laugh out loud, as they usually do. And I wanted to, uh, to ask, in, uh, in honor of that, I have a, an image behind me from the book uh, Caps for Sale, yeah. which, uh, is mentioned in the essay. And I had, uh, this was one of my favorites from being a kid here in St. Pete, going to Northwest Elementary School, wow. watching Captain Kangaroo every morning, where the captain, or maybe it was Mr. Green Jeans, would read a book, and Caps for Sale was a favorite. But you referenced that in this piece that you wrote about uh, baseball caps, and I was hoping that maybe you'd read some of that for us today. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it made me, so I, I have very, very clear memories of my childhood, uh, which are um, accompanied by, since I was the oldest child, oldest of three boys, that my mom and dad um, saved a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and kept a lot of stuff and kept baby books and photographs and things like that. So I, I'm not exactly sure what I'm actually remembering, whether I'm remembering the events or whether I'm remembering in some cases like the, the photographs or images or descriptions by my mom. Yeah. And um, uh, so I don't, I know, for a fact that um, as a three-year-old and a four-year-old, I was being read to by my mother and my grandmother. Oh, yeah. Uh, mostly nursery rhymes, little stories and things like that. But I, I do believe that the first book, but the first book story that uh, is in my memory is Caps for Sale. Yeah. And I loved it so much that it would kind of come back to me over the years. You know, I'd forget about it for a decade, but then something would trigger it. And until uh, I, I started um, actually uh, buying uh, various uh, editions of it. So um, I believe very much, uh, I, I think maybe it's fair to say that um, one way to divide the world is um, between those of us who are fortunate enough to have formative reading experiences early in our lives. Yes. That shaped who we are, shaped how we interact with the, the world, uh, gave us an imagination and a memory uh, for stories. Um, and often uh, took those experiences uh, into schools, uh, into professions, into our expression of citizenship and all of those things. So Caps for Sale is definitely in my personal hall of fame for uh, childhood stories. Well, that, that's interesting. So it, it, there's still some aspects of the peddler and his reaction to the our friends in the trees yeah. that imbues who you are today. That's interesting. My earliest childhood reading memories are maybe Curious George. Yeah. Like that. And, uh, you know, but I never got into trouble in my life. I was always pretty, you know, so George was a mischievous fellow. But. So you want to, you want to get a little taste of this, uh, uh, this essay? If, if folks didn't have a chance to read it, let's, uh, let's see what we got here. Yeah, I'm going to give the Reader's Digest a uh, abridged uh, version. Okay. Uh, and uh, it begins, 
not all babies are born bald, but I was. That was 72 years ago, and what do you know? Here we are again. My dad was an amateur photographer, and I have hundreds of pictures of me. In many of the early ones, they've covered my weirdly shaped head with a diaper, an exotic headdress like Carmen Miranda's, and eventually a little baseball cap. Now, for the record, since uh, the, the fact checkers and pointer may be uh, online, yes, in fact, I was dressed up like um, Carmen. Chiquita Banana, Carmen Miranda, the great Brazilian uh, musical superstar. <laughs> That's me at four, um, four months old, looking uh, to the future for better days. <laughs> That's a classic. <laughs> My dad was a good photographer. Oh, I want to say something else, yeah. uh, uh, which has a sort of a nostalgia aspect to it, is that this photograph and many of the others that I have of myself taken in 1948 and 49, uh, the photograph was black and white photograph, and my mother um, as was a habit in the day or a craft of the day, hand colored the photograph. Wow. Uh, I have uh, several of those, and they're beautiful and they're preserved uh, to this um, to this day. Okay. And they're not like you know, like over rouged or something. I mean, no, like... no, no. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay. So it says here, from that modest beginning, I have become the Imelda Marcos of cats. When the first lady of the Philippines and her husband were deposed, it was reported that she left behind 3,000 pairs of shoes. In 1987, she protested. I did not have 3,000 pairs of shoes. I had 1,060. I deny that I own more than 3,000 hats. I only have 51. I've paid full price for a few and received a few as gifts. The value of the lot, say at 20 bucks a cap, is over $1,000, which kind of, uh, uh, I could have bought a lot of lattes with that money. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> which invites the question, why so many hats, Roy? Why so many hats, Roy? Before we get to the B word, baldness, not baseball, <laughs> I will list two other important reasons why I wear caps almost everywhere I go, inside and outside, so that the cap has been something, become something of a trademark. Now, uh, there, so the two other reasons uh, I will summarize quickly. Uh, one is this great blessing that Dr. Ambrose Updegraff uh, gave me uh, more than 30 years ago, was a surgical procedure for cataracts, yeah, and I my vision went from uh, 2,400 nearsightedness, where uh, I was at risk of not being able to pass the vision test for driving, to now, um, you know, 2030 without my glasses on. So th that was a great blessing, but you know, there's a little collateral uh, disadvantage, which is that I'm light sensitive. Mm. Okay. Um, if, uh, if I'm looking out the window and see a bright light, uh, it can cause some irritation, a little headache. Sometimes night vision is a little bit of a problem. But wearing sunglasses simply and uh, a cap uh, usually does the trick. So I write about this in the, in the column. Okay. The second, so after, sometime this afternoon, I'm going to be visiting Dr. Mock. Uh, who is uh, my dermatologist to take a look at that little spot over there. You know, Floridians have, in general, those of us who have uh, spent a little time outdoors, yeah. uh, have to uh, be careful about basal cells, squamous scales, skin cancer, very, very common, um, uh, easily treatable if you're on, on top of it, and it helps to wear a cap. All right, a little sunscreen, uh, turn it off. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's get to baldness. Here we go. Yes. This section is called, Our National Symbol is Bald. 
God has a good sense of humor. As we get older, he takes away hair from the places we want it and makes it grow in places we don't. Let it be known that when it comes to baldness, white privilege does not apply. I envy heads of color. Thank you, Michael Jordan, Steve Harvey, Shaquille O'Neal, and my friends, the Reverend Kenny Irby and Eric Deggins, even Grace Jones, for trying to make baldness fashionable, dare I say, even sexy for all of us. When you write about race these days, when you're an old white guy like I am, um, you need some backup. And so I shared that paragraph with uh, uh, journalists of color um, who universally laughed really, really loud. So I thought uh, I was safe. So I was encouraged to go on a little bit. Here we go. I always figured if I can make Eric Deggins laugh, I've done well. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed really hard, I have to say. Okay. So this sexy ball thing, right? It doesn't work for guys like me. We need the hat. A pale, bald paint shows enough bumps and crevices to drive phrenologists, those quacks who measured lumps to predict personality, to ecstasy. And Bill, I'm about to, to read the greatest sentence I've ever written. Here we go. A caucus of bald Caucasians reveals more topography on top than a flight over the Caucasus Mountains. <laughs> wow. Peter Mikey, poet laureate of the state of Florida. <laughs> Look out. Stick that in your barracks bag. <laughs> Do, when, when you got that, I mean, do you still, you get a sentence like that and you go, yeah, man, I, I got a big bass in the boat there. That's good. Did yeah, you... I've got to kind of be careful because my, uh, my, latest, um, uh, my latest book is called Murder Your Darlings, which is about taking a sentence like that and really judging it very clearly. Are you just including it because it's clever or does it really, really add to the mix? It added to the mix, I believe. Yeah. That's great. And then it says here, that's why the last time you saw Ron Howard without a hat, he was fishing with his paw. Right. You know, um, Andy Griffith. Yeah. Okay. And then this is one final section. I wear a hat in the movie theater because the AC blows down and turns my bald skull into a polar ice cap. I wear a hat when I zoom because I don't want you to be distracted by the reflection off my head. I wear a hat when I teach a class because I don't want to be blinded by the overhead lights glaring into my eyes. I wear a hat at the coffee shop because I know how to accessorize and that tie-dyed hat really pops with my white golf shirt. I wore a Providence College hat when I delivered the commencement speech at my alma mater in 2017 because the mortarboard looked so geeky. I have six Converse hats, my favorite brand. I have three Pelican hats, my favorite bird. I have 12 Tampa Bay Rays hats, my favorite team. I have two hats for each of these great institutions, the Buccaneers, the Lightning, the New York Yankees, Notre Dame, and most important, Bob Evans Restaurant. I am not alone, Bill. I learned that Rick Kreisman, the mayor of St. Petersburg, has a cap collection built from souvenirs acquired during his travels. He texted me that he may have as many as 50 one of my favorites is one I brought back from Havana, celebrating their 500th anniversary. Any hat for Margaritaville is a favorite, he said. Our mayor is a parrot head. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Since I began this story with my childhood, I will end it there. It's possible that the first book I ever read on my own was a classic called Caps for Sale, written and illustrated by Esfer Slovakina. Right. I love this story so much that I've read it to children for decades and even dramatized it for adults. Now I summarize that. Are we going to read the book? Did you want to read the book? Tell me why, uh, if I can find, yeah, this is an image from uh, Caps for Sale. Why, why did it make such an impression on you? 
it's a very simple story. Yeah, let me summarize it because uh, I, I think uh, it'll uh, I think it'll it'll uh, help answer the question. Out of the way, so folks can see the picture while you summarize it. Yeah, it's fantastic. I can't so really. In the, in the story, the peddler walks through town with a tower of caps atop his head. Caps for sale, he cries. Fifty cents a cap. He falls asleep under a tree. But when he wakes up, the caps are all missing, except for one. He looks around. Then he looks up to see a tree full of monkeys, each one wearing a cap. When he shakes his fist at them or stomps his feet, they imitate him, as monkeys do. In frustration, he takes off his cap and he throws it on the ground. So do the monkeys. Off goes the peddler, selling his cap. Which makes me wonder what I might look like with 51 baseball caps stacked on my head. So actually, I don't have to wonder that because when I uh, would teach that story in yeah. various settings to children, I would bring in a big stack of like raised caps and things like that and stack them on my head. Here's what my hat collection uh, looks like. Uh, at least most of it, not all of it. It's also. You took a photo of it. <laughs> there they are. Organized a little bit. I put the, uh, the, the bolts right in the front because this one the Stanley Cup. And uh, I'm ready to, uh, for the, I gotta get my uh, World Series hat, right? Uh, well, time comes. We have talked before, yeah, your World Series hat. We've talked before about. Uh, the importance of uh, children's books early in life, you know, a good, a good kind of reading discipline and forming one's opinion of the world. Um, talk to me about that because it's something you're really big on and, and we've discussed this before. Let's let me put you in Haslam's you yeah. story. Well, um, so first of all, I want to say that, uh, I can even I can remember this so vividly. So I was married in 19. Oops, next year is my 50th. So 1971, mm -hmm. and we went to uh, Montreal on a honeymoon. And then 15 years later, um, we had three children by then, and uh, Karen and I went back. To, to Montreal for a second honeymoon. And down along the St. Lawrence River, there was a um, kind of like a, a big hangar. And in it was a, was a shop. It was kind of a collectible shop. Mm -hmm. And I went into one of the booths and I, I saw something that just caught my eye. And it was a boy adventure book. Um, called um, Assignment in Space with Rip Foster. That was the name of the book. And it was kind of like a, a space adventure for, uh, for boys, set in the future. Uh, a group of space cadets um, went on this mission. You're in trouble now, by the way. Uh, Try to land on an, on an asteroid. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm in order to uh, um, to get it for the um, the Confederation of Good Planets, uh, who needed um, radioactive material. This is by the so so this is this is a book that I read and then my brothers read in the 1950s, mm. and I said, "Oh my God, I haven't seen this in so long, so many years." So I purchased it. Um, I can't remember, I might have spent $20 on it or something. And I reread it. And I, I was fascinated by this story uh, because I saw something in it. It was a good adventure, but I saw something in it that uh, I hadn't seen before, which was that it was a allegory of the Cold War. Mm. There were these 
uh, the United Confederation of Planets, and there was the consolidation and the, of bad planets, you know, and, and they were called the Kamis, not the Kamis, but they were called the Kamis. Uh -huh. And I looked at the date. This was like 1953. This was, this was a, you know, in the middle of kind of, uh, or attached to McCarthyism and uh, you know, the communists were everywhere. And the author was named uh, Blake Savage, which I was smart enough to knew, know was not really uh, his name. And I tracked them down. This is in the pre-digital age. Yeah. It turned out he was a very prolific ch children's author, uh, author named Hal Goodwin, who had um, many, many government jobs uh, after World War II, uh, including doing field work on radiation, uh, field work, um, when the United States like tested an atomic bomb in the desert in Utah or something like that. He'd go out there with a suit on and uh, measure and things like that. So he was very knowledgeable about all these things. He traveled all over the world and he wrote a whole series of um, uh, boyhood science adventure space books. So I found, a, I found a phone number and I called up this phone number from Mar Bethesda, Maryland, and a woman answered. And I kind of haltingly introduced myself. I said, um, do you remember Assignment in Space with Rip Foster? And she said, remember it? I typed it. And this is the wife of Hal Goodwin. And I, I wrote a big piece for the Times uh, uh, about this back in the day. And then I began a process which probably took me 20 years to complete, maybe more, which was that I tried to recreate for myself, Bill, my formative childhood library from cradle to college. Yeah. I went out, uh, you know, there was no internet yet for me to kind of uh, hunt for books online. Uh, I went to bookstores, I went to uh, you know, all of these things, these places, and I literally purchased um, uh, and, uh, and, and many of them, not all of them, are still in my, my back room in this, you know, and I dip into them uh, every once in a while to remember, to revitalize, my interest, um, and so once again, uh, I can't, my life would absolutely not be the same or as good if it were not for those books and the authors of those books. Well, what does that do for you, Roy, other than being like deeply nostalgic? I mean, as an adult, you can see how they shaped the way you looked at the world. Yeah, yeah. very much so. Very, very much so. And so there's a, there's a theory of reading. So I don't often, when I talk to you, kind of dip into my, uh, my shady career as a literary scholar. <laughs> But uh, there's a wonderful uh, scholar teacher who I feature in the book, um, Murder Your Darlings, named, named Louise Rosenblatt. And she was Margaret Mead's roommate in college, uh, at Barnard College. And she traveled the world, and she wrote, and she taught, and she developed a theory which, and the theory goes like this, that the author creates the text, but the reader turns it into a poem or a story or a report. That is, that I, when I write my column, create a text, but the reader brings to the act of reading 
his or her, her own autobiography. Right? So there's there's a it, it, so if you're if you happen to be a white bald man, if you happen uh, to have skin cancer, uh, if you happen to have cataract surgery, there's certain uh, connections that you might make. And if you haven't had those experiences, uh, I give you the opportunity to have them vicariously as a result of reading you know, the story. So if this is true, if this is kind of triangle of reader, of writer, reader, and text, yeah. what it means is that if I reread something, I have a measuring stick of how I have changed, not just as a reader, as a person. So when I read The Great Gatsby, another book that I, fe I feature in uh, Learning Drawings, mm -hmm. I, I read it, I probably read it once a decade over the last five or six decades. High school, college, graduate school, then a little bit later, yeah. midlife, in my 60s. And the things that I see in it in my 60s that were invisible to me in my uh, 30s, and especially in high school, um, uh, are continue to be powerfully formative. And I understand myself in a different way, not just in relationship to literature, but in relationship to love, to life, to death, uh, to work, to America. Um, and uh, who could ask for more than that? that? That's the value of good literature, isn't it? That it, you know, it, it in a way grows with you. Mm -hmm. I read The Lord of the Rings when I was maybe 14 at Tyrone Junior High School here in St. Petersburg, yeah. and uh, yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I, I, I have, I have not since read the whole trilogy again. It has. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. There you go. You gotta get that. Yeah, I have to call you back. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, it was, probably, it was probably someone reminding me that my. Uh, my car insurance was running out or something like that. Important stuff. Exactly. I, I've been sort of loath to read it again in that it wouldn't be as powerful because I was 14 and, and very impressionable and it made such an impression on me. And I wonder if it would be, as you say, an even more rich experience now that I'm an old bald man too. You know, uh, it's been a lot of years since I was 14. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I still haven't. I saw the films and everything, but it's not the same, you know. No. Yeah. Well, I would, yeah. I, I, I um, I, I would. I always encourage people. You know, it's interesting, is that there's 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 two ways. So there's two ways of of reading something. There's two ways of experiencing stories. One is what I would call a, I use the word what, like what happens. So the first time you read a story, the story is good. It carries you forward. Right. We want to know what happens. Right. That's a definition, right, of a, that's what a page turner means. You have to turn the page because you can't stop. Or when we binge uh, on a Netflix show that's really good, uh, we want to know uh, what's going to happen next. Yeah. But then the question is, well, if you find out what happens next, why would you bother? As Tom French, I think, says he's seen Star Wars, the original Star Wars movie, like over 100 times. Like, why would you do that? Or for me, it's like um, my cousin Vinny, or I, I really like School of Rock. Mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, you know, I laugh every time. Yeah. And so I know what happens. I know what happens. But 
it has become, it's moved from a what story to a how story. There's pleasure in re-experiencing how this happened, right? Which is, which is why after the Rays, if I may say so, uh, beat the Yankees uh, to advance in the playoffs in a dramatic way, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't watch that winning home run too much, you know, over and over and over again. Yeah. With a kind of that maintains its uh, its drum. Now there's there's a there's kind of a third way of reading. So there's a kind of a what reading and a how reading, and there's a kind of a um, what does it mean reading. Uh, and that's the reading that we do from our memory. So um, I know I know what happens in caps for sale, and you do too. Yeah. And it's an easy enough plot to remember. But when I remember it, I'm not really no longer remembering like this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. I have a much you know broader sense of how funny and interesting uh, the story is and, and, and how it teaches us that I'm really going to overstate it now. I, I, I should, <laughs> I may take this back <laughs> that intentionality doesn't always work to help human beings solve problems. Right. It's just an accident. You monkeys, you, you give me back our hat. And all the monkeys can do is, oh, you know, you give a fist, you get a fist. Yeah. But when you kind of express human frustration and throw, oh, there's my head, throw down the hat, you know, suddenly all the hats that you can get back to work. And every time you read it, every time you, you it still pleases you. I mean, exactly. every time. Beverly Cleary was a favorite author of mine when I was young. And, and I still, like you, I went back and re-bought all the Henry Huggins and, you know, Beezus and Ramona books. Mm -hmm. I'll take them out of you once in a while. Yeah. And, and I don't really remember what happens until I get there, but it's always satisfying. Mm. We are um, woefully out of time. And, that went uh, by quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always a pleasure. Let's, let's continue this, man. I, I yeah. Enjoy this very, very much. We didn't even get to um, clack, clack, moo. So uh, we can we can devote a whole episode to that, and it will introduce it will introduce to children, yeah, and adults, and uh, maybe the best work, uh, most surprising work I've ever read, that in such a humorous and interesting, fun way. Uh, reveals the power of freedom of expression in the, the First Amendment. Uh, I just want to know how cows type with those hooves. I, I, I can't, you know, all will be revealed. Let's, let's pencil that in, man. Let's do that one very, very soon. Okay, well, Bill. Always a pleasure. Thank, thank you, man. Today. Go Rays. Go Rays.